Morning, good church. How you doing? We're so excited that you're here. I hope at the end of uh, this series, you're singing that song all the time. This is my story. This is my song. And uh, if I were to tell you my story, I tell you, maybe, maybe this would happen. You're, you're standing in line at uh, Burger King and, and you're just saying, if I, you know, was singing that song and someone says, well, tell me your story, right? That would be awesome, wouldn't it? Well, uh, I, got a, I got a quick story that's pretty cool. And uh, I was walking around Lifeway and uh, I spoke to this guy and, and just said hello to him. We br- bought out a a conversation, and uh, you know where Lifeway is? It's all the way up on 50 and up there by, uh, what is it, Bugsby or what, what is it? Bumby, okay. It's not Bugsby, okay. Bumby. And uh, I invited him to our church a couple weeks ago, and he's here today. Would you stand up so we can give you a big hand, man, you and your lady there? Absolutely. <laughs> Welcome to Go Church, man. That's awesome. Hey, hey, I will tell you, sometimes when you invite people, it works. It works. Even, even, you know, even if the pastor invites somebody, sometimes it works. It's awesome. We have flowers here to honor the memory of Don and Valentine and, and Bill Blakely. They uh, had a great homegoing service on Friday, and God was really honored. What an incredible stories that were told about their life and their love for God. And, and uh, you know, it's sad when we lose a loved one, but it's a it's a celebration when a Christian goes home to be with his Lord and Savior. So that was great. And uh, we're in the middle of a series right here, Testify. And the Bible says that if Christians don't speak out and proclaim the goodness of God, that the rocks are going to cry out. And here's the deal. I don't want any rock crying out for me. I want to praise Jesus and give him the glory. And I want to tell people of his goodness. Now, I want you to think about this thought. As a Christian, and neighbors may know that you're Christian, and they see you gone every Sunday morning, and and your co-workers know that you're Christian, your family members know you're Christian, and and, and, uh, they, they see your jewelry, they see your lifestyle, they see the Bible, they see your bumper stickers, but you never say anything about Jesus. What would you assume if you were lost? Now, think about that. If you didn't know God and you knew someone was a Christian and they didn't never say anything good about God and they didn't brag on him and they didn't uh, tell about his goodness and how he helped them through the day, what would you think? They're not very excited about God, right? And if they're not excited and they know him, why would I be excited about it? You know, that's just a thought. You know, like that guy on the radio says from Campus Crusade, I just want you to think about that. You know, in the Bible, if you turn your worship program on the back or through your phone and our Bulletin Plus app, the the verse that we've been looking at, it kind of is a central verse for this this series. It's found in 1 Peter 3.15. And it says this, something that every Christian should do. But in your hearts, revere or set apart Christ as Lord. Don't just allow Jesus to be your Savior. And and let me tell you what I mean by that. Don't just get a ticket to go to heaven, but make Jesus the boss, the master, the Lord of your life. Make him central to your life and make him the one that you live for. As I said on Friday at the memorial service, make him your treasure. Make Jesus your treasure. And it says, always prepare to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. You know, uh, there are many fears in the world. You know, many fears. I don't know about you, but there's something that I really fear. If you, if you were to ask my wife what she fears, it's anything crawling on the wall like a lizard, a frog, or anything that can jump. I mean, she, She is scared to death of those. What I am scared to death of, she's not scared of. She's not scared of snakes. I don't get that. You're scared of a frog who who doesn't have teeth, but you're not scared of a snake. She'll bend down and pick up a snake. I don't understand it. That's the way she is. She grew up that way. But I am scared to death of a snake. 
And I know where it came from. When I was a little boy, I used to have nightmares about snakes. And I'm still scared of them. And, and I know you're saying, you're a big old boy. You can stomp a snake. But yeah, I ain't messing with a snake unless I have a machete. <laughs> or an axe or a hoe or a chainsaw or a car or something. <laughs> but that's what it's saying. It's saying that people should see hope in our life. And what hope does, it allows us to overcome our fears. When, when you're a hopeful person, you're not plagued and, and paralyzed by fear. You know, the greatest fear that everyone has is that they're going to die. And when it comes to a Christian, this is how it is. With death and a Christian, here it is. You can't touch this. Really, death can't touch me. Death cannot have rule over my body. Rule over my soul, rule over my mind. Because you know what? If I die, I'm going to be with Jesus for all of eternity. So there is no sting to death. There, if you would, there is no bite to death. So I can live a hopeful, hope-filled life because I don't have to fear death. I don't have to fear bankruptcy. I don't have to fear circumstance because I know my God is with me. Amen? Amen. And there is no impossible situation that I can't overcome because God is with me. And that's that's the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And we are to give an answer for that. I cannot wait for you to hear who the lovely lady is today that's going to share. It's going to be my wife. And she is uh, eight months pregnant and we can't wait to meet our son and i want you to give the best go church welcome you've ever given anybody to miss christina here christina good morning go church i'm going to apologize in advance because i took my heels off um <laughs> I've already gone up a couple stairs this morning and my heels caught in my lace dress and I didn't want to wipe out right there on the stairs and, um, you know, I have a lot to, to be wary of at this particular moment in the pregnancy, so I didn't want to fall down in front of you guys. Um, I am so glad to be sharing my testimony this morning. Um, I can't believe I have a little bit of nervousness about it because um, it should be one of the most natural things to share and it is for me. Um, because it is my personal God story. Um, but I think what I'm most nervous about is making sure that I say the points that I really feel that God wanted to teach me along the way in my life so far. And I wanted to say them with clarity, and um, I wanted to give him the most honor and glory. So that's where I think my nerves are coming from this morning, is I didn't want to um, dishonor um, the lessons or um, disrespect God and in, in making sure that I said what he taught me along the way. So if you would, um, let's just pray for just a second before. Father God, I just come before you and I just want to um, surrender to you and I just want to ask that you would um, speak through me this morning. May you get all the honor and all the glory and um, may I um, not glorify any details, but Lord, may I glorify um, your Holy Spirit and your grace that you have extended to me in my life. Um, thank you for the story of redemption. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so last week you heard from one of my dear friends, Darlene Hunter. Um, she's a dear friend of mine and a confidant. And um, if you, didn't she do a great job, by the way, for those who are here to hear it? Yes. If you missed it, you can catch it um, again on YouTube. You can go to YouTube, find Go Church Media, uh, look it up and listen to it there if you missed the sermon and missed her testimony. Also, you can go to www.gochurch.org and click on our media tab and there be able to listen to the sermon and her testimony as well. Um, you can catch any service, any sermon that you missed um, online. So I, I want to encourage you to do that if you are away on vacation and doing things. Um, don't forget that we have resources for you to tap into. Um, the first thing I would like to share with you today about my testimony is, and the God story of my life is um, about how God introduced himself to me and um, how he revealed some of his characteristics about himself um, to me. Uh, very similar to Darlene's testimony last week, I too 
uh, grew up in an abusive um, alcoholic household where my father was an alcoholic. And for the first 10 years of my life, um, my mother, my younger brother, and I um, were uh, victims of domestic violence. Drugs, alcohol, um, abuse, and violence, and trouble with the law were a quote-unquote normal part of my life. And I thought that everyone's family was like that because I didn't know any better as a child. I thought everyone's family was, had these problems or had these things. Um, it didn't stop there for me because both um, of my dad's, uh, of my mom's parents were both alcoholics, and my dad's father was an alcoholic. So when I wasn't with my family and things were tough in my own home, then on weekends when I went to go visit my grandparents, it was also there. Um, there again, lending me to believe that everyone's house was like that. As most um, families in these particular hard situations, um, things always were escalating, and sometimes they were really, you know, bad, and sometimes they were just okay and just kind of plateauing sometimes. Um, but one particular time, this situation of, um, of, you know, trouble and violence were, uh, was highly escalated, and um, my father uh, found himself arrested, and arrested this time for a, a longer period of time. Um, my mom saw this as her opportunity to escape with my younger brother and I and to get away to safety. Uh, it was one of those rare moments that she um, didn't have that she found herself at this time to be able to run away and get away and, and think that she could um, escape this. Um, while my dad was in jail, uh, two pastors came to visit him. And of course at that time in his life, he didn't want to have anything to do with those pastors. He told them to go away. I don't, I don't want to hear what you have to say. And um, when my father realized when he got out that he um, didn't have a family any longer and his wife wasn't at home, he um, decided to admit himself to a 90-day detox program um, in the local VA hospital, okay? While in that program, a Christian nurse shared the gospel with him, and he accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior. Amen. It was, now I say that like calmly, but I want to say it like this. He accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior, okay? At the time, it didn't seem like something to celebrate. And first of all, you know, being at 10 years old, I didn't know it was something to celebrate. I'll just be honest with you. Um, it seemed like a plot at the time to get back with my mom because we didn't know any better. And that's kind of a pattern of people in situations like this. They'll do anything to, to come back and to be back in situations. So... It was approached very cautiously. But what was different for me as a child watching this unfold before my eyes was that um, my father became very humble. And if you know anything about alcoholics or anything about um, people who struggle with any type of addiction, there's a, a, a pride and there's a, uh, um, this, this um, uh, how do I say it, like a lording a dictatorship kind of mentality where they kind of lord that power and that strength over people who are on, around them and underneath of them. And um, what I saw was humility and I saw a brokenness that I had never seen before in my father's life. So it was very interesting to me and I, I kind of took note of it and I noticed it in the letters he would write. He started writing letters to uh, my brother and I and to my mother and he started asking for forgiveness. Wow. I was like, oh, oh, okay. Forgiveness for hurting us personally and for hurting our family. That was big. I didn't understand it. I was only 10, and I tried to receive it as best I could at 10. You know what I'm saying? Um, when my dad got out of jail, he went to visit one of the pastors who came to visit him while he was in there, who he didn't want to have anything to do with at the time, but... Now he did because what was different about him is he had Jesus in his heart. And he wanted to go visit the pastor because that pastor had a church near our hometown. Um, my parents were living separately. Um, they were not uh, reconciling uh, at that time. And my dad took my brother and I uh, to visit that pastor. Uh, what was interesting is my, when we got there is, is my dad and this pastor were visiting with each other and then my brother and I were kind of off to the side and we were introduced to the rest of his family. And that pastor at the time had six daughters, no sons, six daughters, 
And um, I was 10, like I said, and his youngest daughter was eight. And she said to me, hey, you want to go play in my room? You know, I'm thinking we're going to go play Barbies. I didn't really play Barbies, um, but I thought we're going to go play Barbies. And she took my brother with us, and we went into her room, and she sat me down on the floor, and I'm thinking we're going to play. And what she did is she shared the story of Jesus with me. I had never heard it before in my entire life. I just want y'all to know. Because of the family that I grew up in and because of the lifestyle that we lived, um, church, God, things like that, they just weren't in the equation at all. And um, when I heard it, it just is like the Holy Spirit just quickened my spirit and let me know that this is what um, was the difference maker for my dad. And I said, she asked me, do you want to ask Jesus to come into your heart? And I said, I have just one question for you. And she said, well, what's that question? I said, is that what my dad has? If that is who my dad has, then I want that same Jesus right now. You better give him to me. And I closed my eyes, and I asked Jesus to come into my heart right there on her bedroom floor that day. And I've never been the same since. And I praise God for that. What God taught me about himself that day was that he was the God of the impossible. What seemed to be impossible with man, an abusive, alcoholic dad who seemed like he would always be the same forever and ever, uh, situations that would just be there forever and ever, God showed me that he was bigger than all of that and that he wanted a personal relationship with each and every one of us. And it just blew my mind so much, I, I became... I, I became so hungry for God. I um, got a Bible. I got a King James Bible. I didn't understand it very well. I asked people a million questions. I, I started to go to the church of that pastor, and I, I watched his wife, and I studied her like, oh, man, she's just amazing. I just want to know all things about her. I want to know all things about God, and I just became so hungry about it. But I want to share a verse with you really quick. In Matthew 19, 25 and 26, Jesus' disciples were talking to him. And it was about a story of a rich man and how he could get into heaven. And, and Jesus was talking about the, um, just how difficult it may be for someone um, to get into heaven. It was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, okay? And so he says, so the disciples felt like, oh, this sounds like a very bleak situation. So how can people even come to know Jesus? And, and Jesus looked at them and he said in verse 26 of Matthew 19, he said, he looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And that's the lesson he taught me that day in that moment in my life, that with God, all things are possible. And so I had to seal that in my heart, and I tucked it in my heart as a young 10-and-a-half-year-old girl, and I had to just build that spiritual foundation on my life. That was the one of the first blocks of building that foundation of my life, is that God is the God of the impossible. Just a few short weeks after becoming a Christian, I began to learn another thing about God. And... Um, my parents, like I said, my parents uh, were not reconciling. They were actually getting a divorce, and um, my brother and I were living with my mom at the time. Um, I, uh, my mom was a single mom working three jobs uh, to try to make ends meet for us, and I was left a lot to be home alone to take care of my brother and to be responsible for him and to do the cleaning and the cooking and the things like that at, at a young age. Um, and one day, I was um, visiting my best friend at the time. And in this apartment complex that we lived in, um, my best friend uh, lived in one building on the third floor, and I lived in another building on the first floor. And I was over at her place, and I was visiting, and um, I left. And as I was um, leaving and going down the stairs, about two stairs into my trip down the stairs, I tripped on my brand new white Puma tennis shoes. Anybody remember Pumas? And I tripped on my tennis shoes, and I fell headfirst down um, from the third story to the second story. And I landed um, on my face and uh, was knocked unconscious. I do not know how long I was there. I woke up later, much, must have been much later, because I woke up in a pool of my own blood, and the blood was sticky and dry. And um, I woke up, and I tried to get up, and I realized that I couldn't really move very well. And I realized that my neck and my body, my head were on, on the ground, and the rest of my body was on the stairs. And I literally had to um, 
slide myself down the stairs to get up. And um, I kind of, you know, felt like, oh, you know, there's pain in my, my, in my mouth. And so I touched my mouth, and I saw blood, and it kind of freaked me out. And I wasn't really worried about falling down the stairs necessarily. I really should have been, but, you know, I had been knocked unconscious. So I decided to go back up the stairs because I remembered my friend lived there. So I went back up the stairs and knocked on my friend's door, and she looked like she was surprised to see me, like, hey, why are you doing back here? You know, it's been a while since you've been gone. And um, she saw that uh, my tooth was broken off, and she called her mom. Her mom called my mom. L little story, you know, long story short, I ended up going to the dentist that day and not the ER. And because I wasn't able to explain what had happened to me because I couldn't remember, all I knew was my tooth was broke off. All I knew is maybe I fell down, but I couldn't remember anything else. And, um, you know, not, not saying anything bad about my mom. I'm not saying that she didn't know to give me care, but she didn't understand the situation because I couldn't explain that to her. Do you understand? Um, see, I was reminded of that day that God is in control of everything that he spared me much more tragedy than I could have had at that particular time. Because what I found out through x-rays much later in my life was that I broke my facial bones, I broke my jawbone, and I broke my C3. And I don't know if any of you know what that means if you were to break your C3, your third cervical vertebrae. But I should have never, ever, ever got up off that floor and walked again in my life. I should have been a quadriplegic, I should have been on a ventilator, and I should not even be standing up today and saying that I have five children and one on the way. Do you understand the grace of God and how amazing he is? God taught me that there's an enemy who wants to destroy us because we, we are Christ followers, but that he is greater and above everything in the whole universe. And he's above life, death, sickness, health, and he had a plan for me. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Um, I went on to w live a very active teenage life, like I told you. I'm, I'm standing here today. Um, I did karate and archery and riflery and started um, playing women's varsity, started all four years of women's varsity softball, and I'm a classically trained violinist. Like the Lord allowed me to live a full life unhindered by falling down the stairs and could have been, you know, paralyzed for the rest of my life. I graduated from high school. I went on to college at Liberty University where I met and married my wonderful husband, Barry. And um, I became the first person in my family to graduate from college. I graduated with a BSN, a Bachelor's of Science in Nursing, and became a registered nurse. And fast forward many more years from there, um, I go from my story of 10 and a half to um, my story at 29 years old woman, a 29 year old woman. In the year 2000, um, Barry and I were living in Stark, Florida. He was working as a youth pastor and I was working as a nurse. And um, I began to notice that every time I ate, I started to get really sick. And I didn't really recognize that as I was doing community health nursing or um, clinic things that I had found where every bathroom was in the whole town. I just didn't realize that I had kind of maneuvered my life around um, where the bathrooms were located. Um, I began to be so pain, it began to be so painful every time I ate that my, I would double over, I would get cold chills, and I would think, what's wrong with me? My, my, my stomach hurts so bad every time I eat. Um, shortly after this, uh, we moved back to Virginia, and um, less than 30 days of moving back to Virginia, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease in my small intestines. Um, Crohn's disease, if you don't know, is an inflammatory bowel disease that causes ulcers in the lining of your intestines. So anything that passes through is excruciatingly painful. Um, water, food, it doesn't matter, but it's just amazingly painful. Um, I could not believe that I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. I was in, in, in total ambivalence of it, a disbelief, because um, I'm a nurse. So I should know these things. I should have, you know, figured this out. I should have seen this coming, you know, kind of thing. But I was so, you know, taking care of everybody else and doing things with ministry with my husband that I didn't realize how sick I really was. Um, uh, the, over the next 
year and a half, the pain became so bad and um, it began to deteriorate me over the, um, that period of a year and a half that I became literally bedridden as a 29-year-old woman. I had two kids. I had um, my oldest, Kayla, and my second, Joshua, and I just, I couldn't even take care of them. I was so, so ill that I couldn't even eat food. For that year and a half of my life, I drank broth only. I hate broth now to this day. Like, I can cook with it and do things, and I'll do I'll stuff, but the thought of it, like, it alone it, and or drinking it, it really throws me for a loop. Um, I had lost so much muscle mass. I had lost so much weight. I was taking so many um, drugs to decrease the inflammation and, and try to keep the pain down that I just really wasn't sure some days what was up and what was down, much less take care of my little ones that were in the house, and Barry really had to help me with that. Um, I one day was feeling the relentlessness of the pain, and I began to start praying to the Lord. And it's sad that I'm even telling you this, but you know maybe someone can identify with it. That I began praying that the Lord would just um, take me to be with Him in heaven because I just couldn't take it any longer, and the pain wouldn't stop, and the pain wouldn't stop. And each day I wondered why? Why won't He just take me to be with Him in heaven and just stop this agony? Because I can't do anything. I'm just debilitated. And one day I heard the Holy Spirit whisper in my ear, you need to be thankful. I thought, I have lost my mind for sure. I am absolutely crazy. These drugs have messed with my head. There is no way I just heard that I need to be thankful for anything, especially Crohn's disease, especially this pain. Um, what I couldn't see or understand at that time while I was laying there is a lesson I can tell you now, this many years later, um, you know, 15 plus years later, that uh, when I was a little girl at 10 and a half years old and I was in that situation um, with my mom having worked three jobs and me being responsible for my brother and, and me um, having to be responsible for myself in the household is that I learned a really in important lesson sometimes kids learn in those situations as I learned how to survive. I learned how to be tough, and I learned to be self-reliant and independent. That doesn't sound like bad things, does it? But when you're talking about God and coming to a point of maybe being in a marriage, that attitude and those kind of things of being independent and self-reliant, I don't need you, you hear, you hear my heart, you hear what I'm trying to say, hear the message I'm trying to say with that, is, um, hey, I can do a lot of this on my own, and I just need a little bit of you, God. You hear me? Okay? Follow me here for a second. I, I can say this on the back end, but laying there in that bed, I did not see that God needed to take me through this one and a half year time of my life laying in the bed to make me realize something about him is that I was dependent on myself and not on him. And God was going to do something and, do a, and call my husband into something and if I was the way that I was as a wife, I would have ran ahead of my husband. I would have ran ahead of God. And I would have plowed down that field. And I would have been like, okay, let's do this. We're going to church plant. We're going we're gonna to do this and set up that. You know, I am a go-getter. But at the same time, I have been broken by God in ways so that for him to teach me that my strength doesn't come from me or anything inside of me or anything of that nature, that it had to come from him. And there was something God had to do in my life laying in that bed that he couldn't have done, I don't think, had he not broken me so hard like that. And so I laid in that bed, and with my teeth clenched and my, my fist kind of almost up to him in the air, I said, I thank you. I did. I'm being honest with you. I did. And sometimes you have to make your flesh Get in line with your spirit, and it doesn't feel good when you do it, but I promise you if you do it long enough, your flesh will give in. And so each day I said to myself, each day I said to God, I'm thankful, and then the next day, I'm thankful, I'm thankful, until I got to the point where I say, I just thank you for my Crohn's disease, and I just tacked on to it. I don't understand it at all. I don't know why you're doing this. I don't know why you wanted me to go through this. But praise be to God, I know you have a plan. 
And six days later, he gave me a Bible verse. This Bible verse is very, very important to me. It means so much. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He gave me this dialogue that's between Paul and Jesus, okay? And Paul began speaking. He said, but he said to me. Then Jesus began speaking and says, we all, we all know this verse. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I kind of always stopped right there, but there's more to the the verse than this, okay? Then Paul speaks again, saying, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak, then he is strong. Amen? Amen. So that is something God was wanting to teach, with, teach me. And then six days later, I told you, he gave me that verse. And I was astounded. I'm like, oh, okay, God, I, I'm, I, I'm, I got a little piece of it, got a little piece of it. And lo and behold, six days later, I find out I'm pregnant. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I'm sick. I'm ill. I can't be pregnant. This is ridiculous. Oh, my goodness. And I'm like, God, I just started thinking, you know, he threw me into the fire. I'm out of the you know, the pot into the frying pan, uh, the frying pan into the fire. And I said, I, I just started to be thankful for my crush. And he's now you're going to tack something else on there, like a pregnancy. I can't handle that right now. My body can't handle that right now. And, um, you know, God in his infinite wisdom is so amazing, isn't he? Because what I didn't know, um, even being a registered nurse, what I had not learned is that um, there are two main hormones in a, in a female's body, and they're estrogen and progesterone, okay? And during a pregnancy, progesterone is, in, is at full swing, it's increased, okay, and estrogen decreases, okay, so that it can sustain the pregnancy the whole nine months. Well, what's this funny thing estrogen, I mean, progesterone does is it, um, it lubricates your joint, it makes your joints kind of fumbly, and that's when we get clumsy as um, females who are, who are pregnant, and, and then it also lubricates the lining of your intestines, which was so amazingly miraculous for me to learn that little thing. Because what happened is my intestines began to heal, and I started to get better. I started to be able to eat. I started to be able to do things, and I realized that God was, was using this pregnancy and using this situation in my life to bring healing. And praise be to God for that. I'm so excited. He is a good and wonderful God, and... The, this, I have so many more stories I could tell you about my testimony. My time is short. I'm so sorry, honey, I took so long. Um, but I just want to say that um, I had to learn a lot of things being a strong-willed little girl in the situations that I came in. But God is an amazing God. And having dependence upon him is everything. And he, he has the right, because he's God, to do whatever it takes to break us down, to help us to understand and realize um, that he is Lord. And we're not, you know. Um, oh, it's been 15 plus years. Yeah. Yes, 15 plus years. Yeah. Thank. You. Kiss. Sorry about that. What a great job. Give her a hand, guys. You know that I'm, I'm tweaking back my sermon and its length so that I don't go forever when there's a testimony. But, Christina, you couldn't have done any better. What a great job. I'm so proud of you, and I'm honored to be your husband. What I want to do this morning and sharing with you my sermon and, and the testify part of this sermon is I want to give you the steps that you can take to write down your testimony. And that's my goal. And you hearing these stories of these people that are so dear to Go Church's heart, I want you to know that you are so dear to the heart of God and that he's trusted you with a very unique story. And I'm going to tell you, my story can't reach the people that your story can reach. 
your story can reach people that Christina can reach. Our stories are so unique. They are treasures and tools in the hands of God. But like I was saying at the beginning of the sermon, what if you don't share it? If you don't share your story, the enemy gets the victory. And we have got to testify. We have got to speak up. And I know we live in a culture these days that we're supposed to be silent and we're supposed to not uh, confront people with the gospel. But I'm going to tell you what, that is not in the word of God. And I'm going to tell you what people really feel in their heart is that you don't really love them and you don't really love God unless you do go to the awkward place and the uncomfortable place of sharing the gospel and sharing your story. See, the gospel, that word means good news. And your story is a good news story because you'll spend all of eternity in heaven. So there's four points to every testimony. There's four. And what I like to do quickly, and, and I'm going to do this in about 15, 20 minutes, I like to show you those four points in alignment with the life of Saul of Tarsus. And the first point is this. Go ahead and get your pens out. Click that pen. Let's go. It is first point is my life before coming to know Christ. My life before coming to know Christ. And let me read a couple of verses that, that tells us about that. In Colossians chapter 1, it says in verse 21, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. In your past, everyone's past, if you have been born, you were born in this state. You were born alienated from God. You were born as an enemy of God because he deserves, as your creator, as the Lord and God of the universe, he deserves to sit on the throne of your life. But each one of us were born sit on our own th sitting on our own throne. Have you ever seen a toddler put their hands on their hips and say, no, <laughs> mine, you can't have it. I tell you, if Cammie doesn't do it five times a day, she doesn't do it once. They do it. But look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. Go to my next uh, scripture. In Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1, it says, as for you, you were. I love that word, were. It's past tense. He's taught, t Paul is talking to Christians here. You were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. And the ruler of the kingdom of the air and the spirit is now at work in those who are disobedient. You were not only alienated and enemies of God, you were dead in your sin. Before we come to know Christ, we're dead men walking. We're dead women walking. And we're dead because we're not spiritually alive. And so that's why in Romans chapter 5, in verse 10, Romans chapter 5, verse 10, says, for if while we were God's enemies, there it is again, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? See, Jesus, when we were his enemies, he made us alive through our relationship with him and through reconciling us to the Father and, and breaking down those walls of, of us being his enemy. So look at Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9 is the story of Saul of Tarsus, this Pharisee of Pharisees, this highly, highly, highly religious man. Now, he, he studied the scriptures every day. He was a, a rabbi's right-hand man. He was one of the most well-known rabbis, Galilean, he, it was his teacher. And so this was the most well-trained. It's like going, of the, going to the Harvard of today. He was the most well-trained, most uh, prestigious, student, religious person that he could be. And notice what Acts chapter 9 starts out with. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus 
so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, you know that's what they were called at the beginning. Christians were called those who belonged to the way. And, and what did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. So this was what they were called at the beginning. Remember, in Antioch, they were called what first? You don't know what they were called first in Antioch? Christians. They were called Christians first. It wasn't until Antioch where they called Christians, Christ followers. Whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So what he got, he got official letters to go and arrest and, and actually even murder if he had to. Remember, he was the one that they laid the clothes of Stephen. They stoned Stephen because they said he was blasphemous. And they laid this man's clothes at the foot of Saul of Tarsus. That's who we're talking about. That is his life before coming to know Christ. He was highly religious. And can I tell you this morning that being religious is one of the things that will stand in the way of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And as a religious person, and can I tell you, I see a lot of religiousosity in this world. And it is their religion that makes them not like Christianity, just like back in the day. Christians are persecuted in the world today because of religion. So this is what his life was like before. He was a persecutor of Christians, and he killed Christians. He murdered them, and he put them in jail. And that, who, that is who Saul was. So the first point, what was life like? Who were you like before coming to know Christ? Christina shared her, her family situation, what it was like for her to grow up. The second point, fill in the blank, is my Damascus Road experience. Or let me put it another way, how I came to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Christina came to know Christ in that pastor's house with that eight-year-old daughter. And all she wanted to know was, is this what my father had? So with, with our story, how did we come to know Christ? Or with Paul, which was Saul, how did he come to know this Christ when he was persecuting? It says in, in verse 3, would you follow with me? This is going to be a lot of verses, but I'm going to read them fast, but you follow with them with me. They're up on the board. As he named near Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And verse 5 says, who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And notice, this is after Jesus had been crucified, after Jesus has been buried, after Jesus resurrected from the grave. Saul is persecuting Christians. The voice says this, I am Jesus. This is a resurrectional uh, appearance of Jesus Christ himself. And I, I would say that this gives a lot of evidence of the resurrection. Because someone who hated Christ comes confronted with Jesus, and we'll see how this man's life was changed. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied, now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. So they can testify that there was a light. They could testify that they heard a voice, but they didn't make out exactly what was said like Saul, because the Lord was speaking to Saul. In verse 8, Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. His humbling point. Saul was humbled, his sight was taken in, away from him. Because let me tell you, Jesus was showing him that religion had already blinded him to the truth. And so Jesus is showing him, you are blinded. And so now he, he walks in his, in his blindness. And it says, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus, this this person who was self-dependent, this person who was all that, now he's being led around by a little boy or someone who, who was so self-sufficient, sufficient, who was so into himself and so boastful. For three days he was blind. And how many days was Jesus in the grave? Okay. And did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. 
And the Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. As if the Lord didn't know that. But this is part of Saul's testimony. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. I like that word, go. Somebody say go. Go, go church. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings, and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Incredible story. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, Something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up, and he was baptized. Isn't that incredible? Immediately, you, you, you get these things falling off your eyes, and you can see. And he says, I was blind, but now I can see. And what does he want to do? He wants to be identified with the church, and he wants to be identified with the death and burial resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is transformation. This is his story of how he came to know Jesus. And I'm going to tell you what, every time one person comes to know God, there's a celebration in heaven that the good news has been received and a life has been changed. See, the third point of your testimony, as, as the first two points have been about kind of you and how you met Christ and what your life was before. Now you get to the meat. Now you get to the real stuff and you tell people about the goodness of God and about the good news of the gospel. So fill in the blank. Number three, the third point is the gospel. It's the good news. And what, what is that, Pastor Barry? Well, in 1 Corinthians, Paul, who was Saul, wrote he wrote these words, now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Now, verse 3, for what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Number two, that he was buried. And number three, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the gospel. That Jesus died for your sins, he was buried, and he rose again. He overcame the grave, he overcame death, and he overcame the enemy. He is alive. And then it goes on to say, and that he appeared to see us, and then to the twelve. The twelve is the disciples. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then he appeared to all the apostles. And last, the last resurrection appearance is that he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. It is the saw that came to know Jesus that is testifying that God appeared to him, that Jesus appeared to him. Folks, when I share the gospel, I use the A, B, and C. And the A, B, and C is really uh, the Romans road. Have you ever heard of the Romans road? It's five passages, and it's in your notes, that comes from Romans. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've got to admit that we're sinners. And then the second part, B, is that we got to believe in Jesus, and that's Romans 5, 8. Are you keeping up with me, Caroline? Romans 5, 8 is that God demonstrates his own love in this. While I were still, yet still sinners, Christ died for us. That's, that's we got to believe in Jesus dying for us. And then Romans 6, 23 is the penalty of sin, that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And then that goes on in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth 
Everybody confess with your mouth. Jesus is Lord. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's a promise. That if you confess him and believe in him, you'll be saved. And that takes me to Romans 10, 13. And that's the C part. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe in Jesus as the Son of God and a payment for your sin. And C, you must commit and confess. And we do that through prayer. In Romans 10, 13, it says, Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's how it happens. And I challenge you. I challenge you. These are the words of life. Memorize those five verses. I remember uh, when I first got saved, writing them on a note card and taking them everywhere I went. And I would read over those verses every time I stopped at a stoplight. Every time that I got a moment, I just kept reading them over and reading them over. And then I tried to put them behind my back and say them out loud. And eventually, I engraft them into my heart. I got those verses. No matter where I go, I take some of God's Word with me. If I'm stranded like that, uh, that guy who had that uh, volleyball and wrote on it, his name Wilson, the castaway guy, even if I was stranded on an island, I would still have God's Word because I've hidden it in my heart. So the fourth point, and uh, I'm doing pretty good with my time. My life now, the benefits of knowing Jesus. I was, I was on Facebook this week, and I know I shouldn't be on Facebook. At least that's what my wife tells me. <laughs> um, and, and I saw David Ring. You remember David Ring who had cerebral palsy that came here and spoke? He was talking about a conversation he had with a pastor, and he said, this passage that Paul wrote is my story too. It's my life story in the message translation, and it said, or the message uh, version of, of the Bible. The, the, the message isn't a translation. It's a transliteration. It's a paraphrase version, and it says this, because of the extravagance of these, those revelations, and so I wouldn't get a big head. I was given the gift of a handicap to keep me in constant touch with my limitations. Satan's angel did this best to get me down. What he in fact did was push me to my knees. No danger then of walking around high and mighty. At first, I didn't think of it as a gift and begged God to remove it. This is the verse that Christina shared. Three times I did that, and then he told me, my grace is enough, it's all you need. My grace is enough, it's all you need. That's what the Holy Spirit told Paul. And it says, my strength comes into its own in your weakness. Once I heard that, I was glad to let it happen. I quit focusing on the handicap and began appreciating the gift. It was a it was a case of Christ's strength moving in on my weakness. Now I take limitations in stride, and with good cheer, these limitations that cut me down to size, abuse, accidents, opposition, bad breaks, I just let Jesus Christ take over, and so the weaker I get, the stronger I become. Now this is a guy that, that we were talking about, this, this Saul, who was blinded on the road to Damascus. Paul doesn't tell us here what his handicap was, but he tells us that he prayed three times that it would be removed from him. I don't know what his handicap is, but some theologians and some scholars have suggested that he had an eye issue as a residual situation from being blind, and that his eyes would be pussy. Uh, I hate saying that word, but it's gross. But his eye would be gross, and people would see that as he give a testimony, but it was a, a scar to talk about and demonstrate the glory of God. And that's why he's saying, my grace is enough for you. This tells everybody that you were once blind, but now you can see. It's the glory of God. So I close with just two more pairs of, of passages. And I just encourage you. Paul writes this Saul of Tarsus had his name changed to Paul by the Lord because God changed him. And he writes, and matter of fact, can I tell you that Paul 
wrote more uh, of the Bible than any other person, this persecutor of Christians, this murderer, wrote more of the Bible than anybody else. In the New Testament, Paul wrote 13 books of the Bible. That's amazing. In, in one of the prison epistles, Philippians, he writes in chapter 3, But other were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. He says, everything that I've ever experienced, the best part is knowing Jesus. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them rubbish or garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and then the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow, attaining to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already attained all this and have already arrived at my goal, but this, this thing I do, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But it's one thing that I do, forgetting what is behind and straining and pressing toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwardly in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of all things. And if at any point you think differently, then too God will make that clear to you. Paul says the greatest thing that's ever happened to him and the greatest thing that he looks forward to tomorrow is growing deeper and deeper in his relationship with God. And he says all the glory in being able to suffer for him and to 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 give of my life for him. And that's why in Romans 8, maybe his final book that he wrote, in verse 18, he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will one day be revealed. Let me ask you this morning, as I said at Don Valentine's memorial service, the thing, when you die, the only thing that's going to matter is who's holding your hand. And can I tell you that when every Christian dies and every Christian goes into eternity, that Jesus Christ takes their hand and walks them into glory because we are his child. We are we are co-heirs with Christ. Do you have a God story? Do you have a story that you have received Jesus Christ? If you don't, do not leave this place. Get right with God right now, right here. And I want to say this. Many people in this world, they have a knowledge of God, but they do not know him. And remember what Matthew 7 says? Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Only those who does the will of my Father. I could tell you that my story is that I walked an aisle of a church that's 15 years old, and I was lost, and I did not receive God. I said a prayer, but I did not receive him. I just wanted to get my grandmother off my back. And I wanted to do the religious thing. And it wasn't until I was 21 years old till I entered into a relationship with Jesus. And I'm telling you, enter into a relationship with Jesus is a whole lot different than a religious act. Some of us in this room, you may be playing with God. 
You may be treating them like a good luck charm, like a rabbit's foot so that you can have a blessing and have a good life and, and get to heaven. But I'm going to tell you, God will not be mocked. I'm calling you today to get real and get right with the Holy God. If you have wandered away from God, He is the treasure. Repent. Repent. Turn to God and get your life right. There's nothing more important. And there's nothing more important than Christians stop being quiet and start standing up and telling their story. Can I challenge you this week? Learn those scriptures and start memorizing and write down, write down your story so that you can share it. My life before Christ, my Damascus Road experience, the gospel, and my life now that I'm a Christian. If you don't have a story, I want to give you an opportunity right now to, to receive Jesus and have a story. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? If you're not sure you're a Christian and you're ready to make a serious commitment to God, pray a prayer similar to this and make a commitment. Admitting that you're a sinner, believing in Jesus and putting your hope and trust in him and faith in him. Simply pray, dear God, I know that you created me. I know that you love me and you want a relationship with me, but I am a sinner. And I admit that I've lived life my way and not your way. And I'm so sorry. Please, please forgive me. And God, I believe that you love me enough to send your very best, your son, Jesus, who is 100% God. That died in my place. That is the only way I can get forgiveness of sin. I believe, Jesus, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And that no man comes to the Father except through you. So today, I make a decision to believe, and I make a decision to trust in your blood, your payment for my sin. I believe that you are alive and that the grave couldn't hold you. So Jesus, with all that I am, with all that I hope to be, come into my life. Sit on a throne. Be my Lord, be my leader, be my master. Be my all in all right now. In Jesus' name I pray. If you're here this morning and God has lost the first place in your life, as a Christian, would you repent of that and pray and ask him to forgive you? And would you come back to him? If you pray today to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior with no one looking around but the leaders of this church, I want to pray for you. Would you slip up your hand quickly? I pray that prayer and I meant business with God. Amen and amen. All over this place, do not be ashamed. I prayed and I received him and I meant business with God. Raise your hand. Thank you so much. You can put your hands down. How many would say, Pastor, I have not had Jesus as the Lord of my life and as the first place of my life. I know him, but I, I've slipped away. But today I'm coming back. Would you raise your hand? That's me, Pastor. I'm coming back to Jesus today. Would you raise your hand? That's me, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Last, last call. How many would say, Pastor, I'm struggling with something and I need your prayer. Would you slip up your hand? Amen. We care about you. We care about you. You're not in that alone. We're here for you. Father God, we thank you so much that you have walked into this room and that your presence is powerful. Nothing that Christina said, nothing that I've said saved anybody or can change anybody's life. It's your words. It's your presence. It's your story. Our testimony is not ours. It's your story. Thank you for the lives that have been changed. We dedicate it to you. We ask your protection and blessings upon them and that they would, I pray God that this church and these people, especially myself, Lord, we'll get on fire for the living God, that we'll stop playing games with this world.
and stop having an affair with this world and that we would sell out as your bride to you, our groom. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand to your feet? We're going to open up this altar. There are going to be people here to pray for you. But can, can I just ask you to take five more minutes and just sing out your love to a living God and just let him know how much you love him by singing. Come on now, church. Come on now, church. Let's respond to the word of God. <laughs>